All right, welcome back to another episode of the Bosch Juice Podcast. With us today, we have some two really cool guests, just because I personally know them uh, fairly well. We have Rocco Coza and Matthew Bolowitz. How are you guys doing? Doing well, man. Thanks for having us. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. yeah, it's our pleasure. So why don't we just start off by you guys kind of telling us a little bit about your firm and how you guys started. Because Rocco, I know you have a really interesting story around entrepreneurship. <laughs> you know, I know you kind of, I met when I first met you, you yeah. were an attorney, but you know, how did you kind of get to here? Yeah, I mean, so I started, I mean, I started my career, I've been practicing, well, what, 20 years now? So uh, almost 21 I started in big law, then I went in-house, and I was general counsel of an IT firm for 14 years. Um, while I was in-house, I had started practicing on the side, like just helping friends and other real estate investors. Then it was 2018, we had a new company take over, a private equity firm. They were you know, doing a deal with China, and I just got to the point, I'm like, I'm done. Like I was done with corporate America. I knew I wanted to leave at some point, and I just... They, they fired the CFO, who was a good friend of mine, who's actually a client of ours now. Uh, and I just, that was the moment where it's like, okay, I don't think this is a ship going somewhere. Mm-hmm. It felt like a sinking ship. Mm-hmm. And I, as a lawyer, I had no control over it. Like, I couldn't make decisions that moved the ship in one way or another. So, came home one day, told my wife I was resigning. She said, I was waiting for you to say that. She knew it was coming. And then, new CFO came into town. It was... February of 2018, just walked in and resigned. Like we had an all-day meeting scheduled. We were getting acquired by a Chinese company that I was running the running the deal, like doing all the due diligence. Just walked in and resigned, and that was it. And I, it was one of those moments where I thought it would be like that big cinematic moment. It was just nothing. I just walked back to my office, told my assistant at the time, you know, what happened, and that was it. Had four weeks and just kind of figured it out and went on a family trip, came back, and consult with them for a year and I was like okay shit like I I just did that like I need to figure this out so (laughs) it was uh it was probably one of the scariest moments of my life because you know I was comfortable 14 years in a corporate environment you know making good money and benefits and uh then going off where every month you start at zero like no income like you have to figure it out right and a wife three kids my son was you know going to college in a couple years two young daughters it was it was definitely a many sleepless nights, very um, is an emotional roller coaster for a while. But then, because I was involved in other stuff, doing other you know business ventures, I was doing some speaking at the time. Then finally, in 2019, I said, you know, I'm just going to focus on this. Like I'm going to I want to just do the law full time and incorporated the firm in 2019. It was July 1st of 2019. Hired Mia shortly thereafter. Then <laughs> COVID came. <laughs> so uh, it great, was great interesting. timing, right? It, it actually yeah. was. It was because I'll tell you why. Because I looked at COVID as an opportunity. The big firms, like like where Matt worked, he, he came from a big firm. They started playing defense. They were looking at how do we protect partner income, how do we cut out associates, how do we protect the top. I said that's an opportunity for me. So I went after the clients that they like the smaller clients they were forgetting about. I just started building the book of business and. I played offense. I had nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, it's just me and, and Mia. And I'm like, I can figure out how to take mm-hmm. care of the two of us. There was nothing to lose. So then I just played offense and then got busy. And then you came on board in what? October, October 2020. Yeah. And then I'll let you tell that part of the story. And that's kind of how, and then he'll tell you how we got <laughs> to here. It's, it's kind of funny though, when, when you were talking about thinking about making this move, yeah. right? It's, um, I always refer to it as like, it's like the lyrics of a country song. Yeah. When you talk about leaving, you're already gone. Yeah. But you had a plan and you yeah. kind of knew, but then reality starts to kick in as well. So. <laughs> reality is a kick in the nuts. I it, mean, it, it really, really is. is. I mean, because you, 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 I had a plan in my head. You're right. Like right. I had, I'm like, okay, I, I put money aside. I had a hedge. I kind of had this plan, but the plan never works. And then you leave and I'm just like, oh shit. Like, what do I do? Like, yeah. how do I do this? And I just said, okay. I know what I'm good at. I'm good at talking to people. I'm good mm-hmm. at relationships. I said, let me just do that. And literally that first year I made sure that's why COVID drove me crazy. Cause I made sure I was meeting with at least five to six people every week. People I went to college with law school with high school with just letting them know what I was doing. Like, Hey, started my firm. Like this is what I'm doing. Not even trying to get business. Right. That's how, how I think I came to meet you at that time yeah. through your cousin Dom. And it was just meeting people. I was like, that's what I'm good at. I said, I'm just going to focus on that. And that's, how we got to having enough work where I needed to hire a first full-time attorney. Right. So now you segue right in. This yeah. is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> then, That's right. Yeah. And then he's That's, here. 
Yeah, so, I mean, uh, Rocco was talking about being comfortable. I think my comfort level, I think there's two turning points in my life. I think one is when I joined here in 2020, but I think you can go back even further. So we talk about comfort. Uh, my my folks, brought, I have three older brothers. My parents always taught me, you're going to college and you're going to go for a degree <laughs> that is yeah. security-based. Mm. What is always in need? So next thing you know, I'm an accountant. And... <laughs> I get out of college and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what have I done? I loved math. I still do. Uh, love the business side of things, but I couldn't do accounting for the rest of my life. So I didn't know what to do. Here I am in the corporate ladder. So what do you do if you're already in that security comfort level? Your next step is what? Get an MBA. So I signed <laughs> up for my MBA thinking that was going to solve the problem. And then I quickly realized, I'm like, oh, did I just do? I'm not solving anything. I'm just taking the next security level blanket to go up to <laughs> rung number two, then <laughs> rung number three. Uh, so I had to, I had to do a dine, just a complete shift. Uh, I didn't know fully I wanted to do law. I knew I wanted to do something completely different from my family. My three older brothers are successful in their own right. They're taking care of the medical field. They're taking care of finance. I mean, they're all over the <laughs> board. I was like, I can't do anything what any of them have done. I need something completely different. I like the law, but I was already in the MBA program. Mm. So I went to lunch with my boss. I still remember the lunch. We were just on an audit and uh, eating. I think it was Subway at the time. And we were like, <laughs> all right, look, I know you're not happy. What's going on? And I'm like, well, like, this is my story. And he was incredibly supportive. He said, well, you can go and get your law degree. And I thought he was joking. Uh, because I was already signed up for my MBA. And he's like, yeah, you, you know, you're right. I mean, the CEO, he did both at the same time. You really have to be a heavy hitter if you're going to if you're gonna do that. And I'm like, that's it. I mean, he knew immediately that I was like, he okay, that's it. You, man. Game so, on. <laughs> uh, that's what I did. I worked full time. I got my MBA, got my JD degree all, uh, all while, like I said, working um, full time. So that was a long three and a half years of my life. Went would, you, in, would you do it over again? Oh, that's a tough, that's a tough question. Yes. It's a lot. I get it. In the moment that, I mean, that was a heavy, uh, heavy burden to climb up that mountain that, you know, went in dating someone came out single. That's just kind of the nature of the beast. (laughs) Um, so, but it all worked out. Uh, I met my wife shortly thereafter. So, um, but yeah, that was a big turning point. I remember first week when I, uh, of law school where I was, it was the entire year, I would work until 5 or 6. The class started at 6 p.m. It would go to 10 p.m. Then it was, that was four to five days a week, work on the weekends. And when all the fellow law students were done for the summer, uh, that's when my MBA picked up and I was doing the same thing. So that was for three and a half years of my life, right in the mid-20s. So oh, yeah. uh, that, that was a tough sacrifice, but it all worked out. I was happy to do that. I shifted from my accounting job and uh, what Rocco was saying, I was working for a larger firm downtown. And fast forward a handful of years, that went straight into 2020, and that's when COVID hit. <laughs> and I was already, it was funny because I, one of the most demoralizing feelings was I was in a large law firm, but I had that gut feeling of, oh, man, I'm still not that happy. What's going on? And to talk about it, I just spent three and a half years <laughs> right. of my life thinking I was fixing a problem, and then I still had that feeling. I'm like, this is not good. Yeah. Um, and Honestly, it was that shutdown for about two weeks when really everything from our firm, at least, was on hold. Uh, No one was really doing anything. Everybody was running for the hills. Uh, That was probably the most beneficial thing that could have happened for me because I just, I woke up and I realized I am relying on someone else for everything. Mm -hmm. I was playing the internal politics right. I was on the partner track but I was still relying on someone else. And I hated that feeling. And that's what it was. I didn't like that. I thought the legal industry needed to be flipped on its head anyways. And we, that's a whole other conversation, but uh, that's when a friend of mine said, man, you're talking very similar from one acquaintance. I know Hmm. you should go and meet him. And that's, that's what happened. We started talking, went, went to a couple lunches and I was like, you know what? Let's, I'm going to jump ship. Let's let's join forces here and let's see what we can build. So that was in 2020. Wow. 
The only person that? ever beat me to an interview showed up an hour early. <laughs> really? I was there. I That's was right. there an hour early to get something to eat. He just forgot to change his daylight <laughs> savings thing. <laughs> That's right. Come like, on, man. I was coming from a meeting. I was like, we, we were meeting at Panera, and I was like, I'm gonna get there an hour early, just eat something. I'm starving. Right. I sit down and I see this dude sitting like a couple of tables ahead of me in a suit. I think he came over and he asked if I was being like this. Other effort, <laughs> like no one beats me in these interviews, and he was there. And then you know we had a good conversation. Then maybe take you out again and tell you more, and then that was it. And then the rest is history. And it's and that was it. I mean, that was a big turning. Like at what yeah. we were talking about before, that was a big turning point because, I mean, again, you play the corporate ladder. Yeah. Even yeah. in a law firm, you're playing politics. Yeah. You're doing all the right things. You're getting paid well. Mm -hmm. And there is something to be said. One for entrepreneurs, they're their own type of crazy. Yeah, absolutely. But I sure. also think there's something to be said for your first employee or in this situation, first attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, they are a special kind of crazy, too, because <laughs> they're not only betting on this business or this. Right. They're betting on the, a person. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. that was a big thing for my wife, Carly, at the time. We joke now. She only cried for two weeks when I told her <laughs> of the decision. I was like, met this guy named Rocco. <laughs> We went to lunch a couple of times. He bought me a couple of drinks. I'm going to, I'm going to go quit my job and I'm joining him. Um, so yeah, that takes a special yeah, kind of crazy yeah, to do yeah, that. So, does. um, but I mean, we'd laugh about yeah, it now. That's why it works. We yeah, both have a special type of crazy, yeah, but you have to be, I mean, it's to. like, I didn't know how to start a law firm. I had no idea. Like I just said, okay, I'll figure it out. And it's just, and that's really what it's been right. for four years, just punching and kicking and getting to where we are by just pure sheer grit yeah i mean it's you figure out things along the way but it's you gotta get the right people yeah. you, ha you have to surround yourself with the right people you have to learn from your mistakes you know get back up and just mm -hmm. not let the bullshit that happens because there's a lot of it yeah. it's never you know, gonna end either it doesn't it's end. just yeah, it different doesn't. bullshit it's different it's more you know? complicated bullshit mm -hmm. like i'm realizing that now the more people we have like things still happen it's just more complex now because there's yep. more people there's more things to deal with there's more moving pieces and it just makes things more complex but it's still stuff you got to deal with and it yeah. never never changes Absolutely. you brought up a point about um you know being your own person you're not relying on somebody else i think that's part of this whole spark as an entrepreneur and then we talk about you know with a, with people in law yeah um they're wired a certain way mm -hmm. so to have both of those mm -hmm. That's that's super unique, and it's yeah. it's a really great thing. It, it, it and, I, and I think uh, that's a good point. So I think we are we, we are wired very differently here because mm -hmm. there are traditional lawyers, right? Like I always say, any type of talk I've done, I said there are two types of lawyers. There's there's lawyers that practice law, and there's entrepreneurs that sell legal services. We are the latter, right? Our business is selling legal services, mm -hmm. but at the heart of it, we're business people. We have to understand marketing, branding, sales operations systems like the law is what we sell mm -hmm. and we have to be phenomenal lawyers which everyone in this place is but we have to look at it from an entrepreneurial perspective and that's why i believe we're truly trying to flip the industry on its head like matt said that's what he was looking to do and that's what we're really trying to do approach the law differently and and carve out a different path for ourselves isn't it so cool when you start to dream all of this up in your head you start to map everything out and then you're actually walking through the door <laughs> that's that's i mean nobody knows <laughs> how many failures how many th you know yeah. headaches how many all these th wiring technology everything yeah. Yeah. they just don't know yeah. what happened all they see is a pretty blue sign on the on the in a, your, your beautiful lobby here yeah. yeah and uh they don't realize everything else that went into it yeah, that, yeah. i mean that, that's a good point. i i always say like no one knows the sleepless nights no like, except my wife like no. that's the only person that knows like how many sleepless nights i had yeah. Like worrying about everyone but myself. Yeah, yep. but not true. But but what made, to, to me what makes it all worth it is is seeing like my daughters put on our our shirts that have the logo on and wear it to school and like be proud of it. Mm -hmm. Like that to me makes all those sleepless nights, all the stress, all the things you worry about worth it. It really. Right. But no one sees that stuff. Like no, it's no. it's they just see the name and they're like, oh, you guys yeah. are doing well. It's like, well, yeah, well, it's a climb. Yeah. Well, that's what I love about every person that we hire now. We always say that we are still on the ground floor mm -hmm. maybe the first level of the skyscraper yeah. that we're trying to build right and we we already see it now mm -hmm. with the team that we've had we just moved into this place 18 months yeah give or take uh where we were previously i mean we talk about it like yeah. it's nostalgia now it's, it's <laughs> just thinking it back terrible. to 
<laughs> well, I mean, it was perfect for the time. Like that's it was it was fan it was yeah. fantastic. So, yeah. but even now, I'm so excited not to wish time away, but 25 years from now to look back mm-hmm. and every step of the way, it's just phenomenal. Where yeah. I came from, I talk about this at nauseum. Where I came from, great coworkers. They had a holiday party. They had a 25 year reunion or anniversary of the firm, and you still had the core group there, the people who just grinded it out from the beginning. And it was, I mean, it was phenomenal. I just, it, it stuck with me. It will remain with me. And even now, I mean, I've only been yeah. here for three years and we look back and we're like, wow, like, can you remember that window unit that you had to <laughs> stick a pen cap in because it just kept rattling when you were on the phone? Uh, like yeah. that's, I, that's the stuff yeah. that I love. Like that's, that's the journey is what I love. <laughs> and that, and that's, that's the picture I think is so interesting to me yeah. and like why we like doing this show is people don't realize that. Yeah. I, I was guilty of that too. I, I say all the time, I grew up and I had friends who had fathers that owned businesses yeah. and they had a ton of cash. And yeah. in my head, my correlation was you have a business, you make good money, life is easy. Yeah. And it, it is, it has <laughs> been the hardest thing. Yeah. I've ever done in my life. And you're right. Sleepless nights. People don't realize people don't, you know, they, they come in and there's always problems and they think that either you have, I have the solution to everything. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Or like, you know, I, I have, you know, everything that's important to them is important to me. It's like, I have 40 other things on my mind at this current point in time. And like, I'm really sorry, but your little situation might not be my biggest concern. That's, that's the hardest thing. And Mm -hmm. and it's, it's, you know, like I always joke with people, I have my shit together. I'm like, ah, I don't have my Mm-mm. shit together. Like, I'm usually a mess. <laughs> like, I just hold it together pretty well because you're because you're right. Like, as a business owner, my mind is in a thousand places. Like, I have to make sure because you know, I, I try and look at myself as a as a, a leader that serves. Like, I, I serve my people first, so I have to make sure that everybody else is taken care of. So that's always a worry to me. So I'm always thinking about is everybody else good, and then I come to myself last, and it's like. There's so much going on. Like we have clients, we have employees, we have, you know, have family and it's just, mm-hmm. my mind never turns off. And that's the hard, that's the, as an entrepreneur, that's the hardest part. I think that people don't get like I have friends that have jobs, right? They come home, they can unplug mm-hmm. and they can relax. Like I, I don't ever have that luxury. Like I, I haven't figured out a way to do it yet. Like I meditate and do all kinds of other bullshit that helps a little bit, but like at night it's very hard for me to just flip a switch Mm-hmm. turn off and then turn back on the next day. Well, it's constantly going. Little secret, yeah. cigars and bourbon. I mean, that really, <laughs> that may yeah. be part of the ticket. No, <laughs> seriously, I, I, I think exactly what you're saying. Like, there's a lot of pressure we put on ourselves. We put yeah. ourselves in these positions, though. I worked in the corporate world for 20 mm-hmm. plus years with architects and engineers and um, great experience. I called it a, uh, uh, a really nice paid internship. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, started thinking about, man, I know there's more to this. There's more. And leading up to where you're going to make that decision to move on and go from there. So I've been in my business for 14 years now on my own, yeah. um, love my clients. And it's just one of those things you, I feel like I bought back my life. Yeah. You know, I want to go see my kids in, in hockey and basketball mm-hmm. and piano and, and everything that, they, that they're involved with. Yeah. There were times when I was being dragged in every direction. And that's probably a lot of, you know, a lot of common threads based yeah. on where you were, or what you'd been doing. And, Absolutely. and hopefully, you know, it's, it's moving, it's trending in the right direction for mm-hmm. you where you can enjoy your family and, and, and do you work your ass off. Yeah. You might as well have yeah. fun. In the process, you might as well enjoy it. I, I, I say that all the time. Like I, I don't, I don't feel like I work. I love what I do. I just have a thing that I show up to every day. And it's, it's part of my life. And, and, and the hardest thing I think about being an entrepreneur, and we've talked about this in the past, it's like there's choices you have to make, right? Like I, I, I want to be at all my kids' shit, but I can't because mm-hmm. I have to be here sometimes. Like there are just certain things. And I used to struggle with that when I was in corporate America. Right. Because it's like I, I didn't have control. Mm-hmm. So someone was telling me I had to be somewhere when I wanted to be somewhere else. Now I'm at the point where it's like I have that control. So I've just gotten OK with the decision I made. Mm-hmm. Like it's like I've chose to be here because there's a reason why. Like No one's making me stay to do this. I'm just choosing this because this is something he's done right now. And I'm going to miss this. I've just gotten very clear in being OK with those choices. And that's made it very easy for me now as an entrepreneur to deal with those things as opposed to when I was in corporate America. I think that's a struggle a lot of people have until you really figure that out. What's a, I think the the cash register always needs to to ring. Right. Otherwise this is a hobby. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. But, <laughs> exactly. But no, it's cool. I, I love listening. You were talking about 25 years from now projecting. Yeah. So we'll look back on this and go, man, that Boss Juice podcast, that was the one that catapulted them <laughs> into the next <laughs> level. That's it. Yeah. Who would have thought, right. you know? That's right. That's right. No, it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely, I mean, when, when, just looking back at the history, the guy always joked, my first office was $100 a month. Like wow. I split it with an attorney. It's this little hole in the wall in Carnegie, and that was four years ago. That's and when your your name was Saul Goodman. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I felt like. Right. I, I had this little shitty office. There was there was no windows. It was internal. It was in like within a doctor's office. So like we rented space within a podiatrist's office. Mm-hmm. And I think it was like I think he paid like two hundred or three hundred bucks a month, and I paid him a hundred bucks a month to have one of the offices. Wow. And it's like now we're here. We have 40, 500 square feet. That journey, man. What you go through is hilarious <laughs> when you look I back. Mean, it's embarrassing, but hey, it is what it is. It's sometimes. the history, though. I, same thing. I look back on mine. I think like, man, there's so many things like, did I really do that or say <laughs> that or think that? You know, and whatever. It's all part of it. You can't erase it. <laughs> no, you, you know? can't. It, it makes it who we are. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting, though, because like I always say hindsight 2020. Mm-hmm. And you talk about making decisions. You just keep moving forward. Yeah. There's a lot of decisions I've made mm-hmm. in my business where I'm like, if I could go back, I would do it a lot differently. Okay. You know, so, I mean, you guys are attorneys, so I'm sure you see a lot of people's, for lack of a better term, shit, you know, kind of like the, the dirty work, stuff mm-hmm. like that, you know. What do you say about that? What would you say about, you know, kind of making decisions, even if it's the wrong one, and rectifying that, you know? You want to take this one? Oh, man, you... You can go a million different yeah. ways. I mean, there there is value in making the mistakes as long as the mistakes aren't costly. Sure. So it's finding which ones are the costly mistakes. Yeah. And that's, I mean, as attorneys, that's really where we want to be a part of. We tell clients, our, our lines are always, just text us, call mm-hmm. us. We would rather spend five minutes talking to you before a problem happens until, rather than you calling us and say, hey, by the way, I entered into this contract. Uh, I don't think I did this right. Can you unravel it? Right. What do I always say? You can't unscramble a frittata. Yeah. So <laughs> what's line. done is done. Yes. So um, we can try to get out of it, but it's going to be very costly. Mm-hmm. So rather than spending a few hundred dollars up front, now you're spending tens of thousands trying mm-hmm. to get out of it. So sure. uh, there's value in making mistakes and learning from them. I mean, we do that here yeah. all the time, just just growing. That's how you grow as a person. That's how you grow as a company and a business. Uh, but you need to find ways and have a team around you where you can avoid the costly landmines. Yeah, and I, and I think when it comes to decision making as well, I think what I've at least experienced in, in my 20 years of doing this, you know, as a lawyer advising and in my own journey as an entrepreneur, is learn to make decisions quick, like yeah. like slowing down, like think taking too long, an indecision are costly decisions in my in my mind. Mm-hmm. Like I think people get more caught up and have more problems when they either procrastinate and take too long to make a decision or just don't make a decision. Yeah. Like just make the decision, deal with it. Like right. if it's wrong, that's okay. That's how you learn, you make mistakes. But if you sit there in limbo for too long, that's when problems perpetuate. And I've seen it happen so many times with businesses where they just, oh, I know I need to fire this person but I'm not sure. And then the problem just keeps getting worse. And and then it's like a poison pill within the organization. It's like, and it just, it it could have been nipped in the bud three weeks ago, but because you waited, it it, it just kept making it worse. And that's where I think when it comes to decision-making, learn to make decisions Mm -hmm. fast and just embrace the decision you made and have, like Matt said, have the team around you that can help you fix it if you make a mistake. Right. That's really it. When I worked in the corporate world, there were, there were board of directors and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And I felt like there were so many times that opportunities flew right by yeah. because yeah. in decision, exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Then I worked for, with a guy in um, DC for years and um, he would say opportunities are like a slippery fish. Mm-hmm. So you better grab onto them now or yeah. they're going to be gone. It's, it's so true. Um, but the other thing is too, t- to your point, mm-hmm. Rocco, he said, uh, you got to you got to think it through a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, because yeah. there there are consequences sure. for every decision you make, good, bad, and otherwise. Yep. So, and I think I think that comes with experience. Like I, I look at you know, like I always say, I'm like not I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I've just built up enough experience and skill sets where I can make decisions quick because yeah. I have enough information that I've you know built over time and been in enough situations where I can take the facts of where I'm sitting and process it quickly and move and, and move through that decision. I think that comes with experience, right? right. The, mo- the more you put yourself out there, 
the more you put yourself in uncomfortable situations as an entrepreneur, you build that muscle. So I can, I can chase those opportunities quicker because I can process the information a lot faster than someone, you know, that's 10 years behind me. That just comes with experience. And I think that's, yes, you have to think through them, but I think as you develop as an entrepreneur, your ability to think through things is exponentially increased. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I think experience, like mm -hmm. I always say, people always, my uncle always tells me, he's like, you're young, time is on my side. And I believe that. Yeah. I, mean, like, I have the opportunity to make mistakes, but my biggest downfall is I don't have the years of experience. Mm -hmm. So when I make mistakes, usually it's like they're costly or it's <laughs> like, like, ah, uh, and I hope I don't make the same, same mistake twice, yeah. but don't make the same mistake. Yeah. Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. But well, I mean, you touched on it though. I mean, one making decisions quickly, but two having the right team around you. Mm -hmm. So just take the time to ensure that you're nurturing those relationships and that you trust your yes. team around yeah, you. Right. So we always talk about when clients say we need legal help. And then we ask a question, do you have an accountant or do you have a CPA that you work with? No, no, no not really. Or we do, but I talk to them once a year. It's like, okay, well, wait a minute. Why don't we take a step back? You should have a better relationship yeah. with your CPA where you can give them a call and they're willing to talk to you. Mm -hmm. So we always push for accountants, CPAs, a good insurance broker, a financial planner. Am I missing any? No, I think, that, like, I mean, but ba bankers, I mean, yeah. and, and again, it is having the right relate and, and understand, like I, I just, I had a lunch today and I, I was talking to one of the gentlemen and he, he was, he was saying that, you know, I had referred him over someone and he said, I talked to the guy, but you know, I gave him the price and he didn't want to pay. I said, well, I, and, and I know the person that he was talking about and I know the, the size business they have. And to me, where I think entrepreneurs get caught up, they're penny wise and pound foolish. Mm -hmm. Like, you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. Like, if you want to pay a CPA 500 bucks a year, like, they're going to do your tax return. That's it. They're not going to advise you. They're not going to tell you what to spend yeah. money on, what not to spend money on, how to lower your taxes. If you pay a CPA five to $10,000 a year, you're going to save twenty to 50000 in taxes. Like, that's just the way it works. Mm -hmm. And I think same thing when it comes to lawyers, right? Like, people, if I quote somebody my hourly rate, and they're like, oh, you know, that's high. You know, the guy down the street is half your rate. I said, well, you're not paying for the hour. You're paying for the 20 years I bring to the hour. So what may take this guy three hours is going to take me 20 minutes because I know how to do it. Right. So you're actually paying less because I have the experience to do it. So people have to think through. They, they get too caught up on price and not look at value. you got to look yeah. at the value. And I think entre I've seen so many entrepreneurs, especially startup entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. get so hung up on that. And I always say, like, if you're not ready to invest in the right team, you're probably not ready to start a business. Yep. Yeah. Because there's got to be – you've got to be willing to put that money – that investment into the foundation you're building. Yep. And that's a great point. Cause I, even with our business, yeah. when we have startups, we're with a lot of startups and yeah. we'll say to them, okay, you know, we understand that money's tight. Maybe you have very little funding or no funding. And we'll say, but we'll have these flexible terms where mm -hmm. like you can pay 500, $800 a month. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, they're like, Oh, like that's out of budget. I'm like, and in my head, that's a weed out because yeah, it's like, right. if you cannot afford to invest eight hundred dollars yeah. into this business, you're not serious about it. That's you have, exactly you have, right. you have exactly no right. risk on the table. You have no like skin in the game. You're mm -hmm. just this is a hobby. It, it is yeah. You are not actually interested in building a business, and yeah. so I'm not interested in working with you. Yeah, no, that's that, and that's a great way to filter out clients too. Like it's not not saying you want to do that, but I think that's I mean, a good way to do it. Yeah, I think it's necessary though, because if there's mm -hmm. Particularly, like with startups, uh, one of the things that I always said, it was a business partner, I always bring his name up, Jim Valenti, passed away a couple of years ago now, a year and a half ago. He was a great business partner, but he would always say, um, get the money details worked out. Um, mm -hmm. He would say a lot of different pieces, same okay. same circle, same, same yeah. scenario, um, but it was always very true, mm -hmm. you know, just a really good man. Um, Antonino and I, we have our own businesses. Mm -hmm. w there are years between us, mm -hmm. but that's one of the really cool things. We kind of jockey off of each other all yeah. the time. We have a weekly meeting where we catch up on Fridays. Um, I think the some of the networking circles mm -hmm. and suppliers, people that we deal with, yeah. you start to identify. Like in the corporate world, I was stuck with what we had and who we had yeah. and whatever, however those relationships <laughs> um, came together. You were stuck. Now we're in a position where we can make these choices, surround ourselves not only with good people, yeah. but also all the other resourceful um, people that we can bump into, you know, to help 
drive our goals, and we're helping them in the same same yeah. way. I think this is really good information for our podcast um, viewers, listeners to hear because I think that it helps them ramp up mm-hmm. a yeah. little bit more quickly. We're sharing a lot of knowledge that you know this knowledge base yeah. that sits on our shoulders <laughs> that took a while, Absolutely. you know, to happen. Yeah. We want to help them, mm-hmm. you know, pull some some golden information out of this and. And do really well. I want to see people be successful. Yeah, you know? and, and a lot of times it's just getting in the room. Yeah, yeah. Like people just get out there and get in the room. Like mm-hmm. you meet people. Like that's if you're if you if you're as a business owner, entrepreneur, even someone in a career that's trying to get to the next level. If if you can do one thing, just get out there and meet people. Mm-hmm. Like just go shake hands. Like not yeah. go online. Like literally go out and meet people. One, you develop the skill set of talking to people communicating face to face and being able to read a person's mannerisms. That's a skill set that has gone by the wayside in my opinion today. So when you you can see a person that knows how to work a room and talk to someone, they're head and shoulders above most people not these days because of COVID and everything went online. So just if you want one thing to do, just do that. Yeah. Like that that simple thing will increase your success, I believe, by fifty percent in a two year period. Yeah. And, and the thing is about that, it's just um, you put a lot of time into mm-hmm. these relationships. And I think in, in my case, it's, you know, when I first started Core 3 Group, mm-hmm. I, we talked about this before, man, I drank a million cups of coffee, <laughs> met with people, Panera's, everywhere else, you yeah. know. And then all of a sudden I started thinking, like, I'm putting a freaking boatload mm-hmm. of time in wheels that are just spinning and spinning and spinning. So now I call it, like, selective networking Mm -hmm. it's you you want to be in front of people Mm -hmm. but you also want to do something that's going to make the best um resourceful time wise yeah you know so you're not just going in circles i think a lot of people just getting into it that's what they do you know you're trying so hard but um so with your background how did you how did you get into law how did you get into the direction that you wanted to go what what drove you? Because we've interviewed a lot of people, and this is the first, from a professional services standpoint, yeah. first law office that we've spoken with. Yeah, yeah so uh, when I was a kid, uh, I was an arguer. I was very logical, and I always, like, I debated everything. Mm. It was, I, I always tried to talk my way out of things from a kid to relationships I had I was always like <laughs> finding ways to talk my way through things got your ass beat a lot by your parents didn't you <laughs> well, I mean I have an Italian mother like she, <laughs> she kept me in line trust me so she kept me in line but I, but I was uh, that there was the I, I liked the art of arguments and so I I just gravitated towards law but I was an entrepreneur as a kid like I sold baseball cards I started businesses I would do all kinds of stuff like that so I knew I wanted to own a business. I wanted to be a business person. So I looked at the law was the, the, the best path. That was a means to an end. Like I knew I never wanted to be the guy that worked in a big law firm and raised a partner and died there. Like I wanted to do my own thing. Like I went into corporate America and I did that, but I knew this is where my heart lied. It was the entrepreneur path. Mm-hmm. So the, I always looked at the law is if everything in my life fell apart, I still had something that I could do. I could hang a shingle and make money. It gave me some, it gave me a license to make money. So that's what, that's kind of how I gravitated towards it. But when I was in college, I actually, I went to college as pre-law, switched to psychology and actually applied to, to go to a PhD program in psychology. And I, I let fate take its course. I said, if mm-hmm. I get into that, I was going to go into child psychology. I said, that's what I'm meant to be. If I don't get in, law is where I'm meant to be. And I got waitlisted and said, took a year off and took the LSATs and went to law school. Mm, but it was, it was the art of argument that really, like, I loved that. Like, I, you know, I competed in logic games when I was a kid. Like, I was in the gifted program, so I would go to these different schools and compete in these logic games. So I just loved that, the ability to put an argument together. Those are really, like, great foundational opportunities, too. Yeah. To yeah. be involved with those. Yeah, those well, I mean, it really, it really was. I mean, I came from Newcastle, so it was like there was, you know, there was nothing up there. It was, you know, so it was, I, I was, you know, not the best school district, but I had really, you know, impactful teachers yeah. over over my childhood and, you know, uh, impactful, you know, family. And I think that I just always had that, like, love of argument. Mm-hmm. And even now to this day, like, I, like they always joke, like, I answer a question with a question. And it's <laughs> and it's simply because, like, and I did that as a kid. Like, I look back. Without as, fail. Yeah, without <laughs> fail. Right. But but I, 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 I started thinking, like, do I, am I an asshole? Do I do that a lot? 
but I, but I started thinking, like I did it as a kid, but it's, and I was explaining this to my wife the other night, and I said, it's only because I'm trying to answer the exact question you're asking me. So if you ask me a question and I need more information because I don't know exactly what you want me to answer, I'm going to answer you with a question yeah. until I get to a point where I can pinpoint exact. I won't ever give somebody too much information. Like that's kind of the lawyer in me. Like I'm only going to give you enough that I know is what you want. I'm not going to give you too much. So I just always my and even as a kid I did. Like yeah. I remember like girlfriends I had growing up. <laughs> like they would ask me a question. I'm like well, what do you think about that? Or I would just ask them a question back to deflect because <laughs> I was trying to figure out what they were trying to ask. Like did I do something wrong? Like what did I screw up? Like what are they trying to get me to say? Yeah. So I'd keep asking questions to really narrow the focus, and I do that now as an but adult. Sounds yeah. like you digested things really quickly, so you could move on to. You're already asking the next question. You're leading on to it because yeah. you got you got what you needed up to that point. Yeah, that's that, cool. That, that's what I do. But that sometimes is a, is a downfall too, because sometimes <laughs> it I, I'm thinking too fast and I might miss something. But that is a lot, a lot of what I do. Yes, yeah, going but back to the experience, mm -hmm. you know, it's the same. It's the same thing. You can do that because of the experience. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I would say that's a good thing because I think like with entrepreneurship, I mean, it is. It's about asking questions, like yeah. thinking outside the box. I mean, I always say all the time, you know, I not to not to talk down about like a, a college degree. I have yeah. one. I you know I have a degree yeah. in computer science, but. If I could go back, I think it was kind of a waste of money because, like, it was like I could learn. I learned how to actually develop mobile apps through YouTube. Yeah. It was like you know I got a degree so I can get a job somewhere, yeah. but it's like you know people say, "Oh, that's not the way you do it," but it's like train yourself to think outside the box because there's there's like forty thousand ways to get to the point where you want to be. Right. You know? mm -hmm. I mean that, that. I mean that's so yeah. true. I mean, I mean just think of like how your path was. It's like completely to get to where you are now. Like it was completely untraditional. Path, right so like you thought outside the box you went a whole bunch of different ways and yeah. it's that's how we operate with clients yeah that trial and error <laughs> i found out what i didn't want until right. finally you know started checking off the boxes and then figured out what it was yeah. that i liked yeah that's life. if somebody's heading this direction mm -hmm. say oh, sorry about that if they're if they're heading this direction i'm italian so yeah you know, this hand has to fly <laughs> um, I'm say wait, man. <laughs> what what do you really love about what you do and what is the, like the worst thing that you really dislike about where you guys are? And that's a question really for both of you. What you really love about this and, and what is like one of the fallbacks that people should know about? I, th I mean, I, I think one of the greatest things, I, I, I'll be curious to what your answer yeah. is, but I, I do believe we talked about this quite a bit. One of the best feelings that we can get is when you're talking to someone or a client on the, or potential client on the phone and by the end of the phone call they say man i mean thank you so much i my mind is at ease like i have such peace of mind right now uh and yeah that's that's why we're here thank you if you need anything just give us a call back that's the best feeling yeah. so i would say that yeah it probably tops it for me mm -hmm. yeah. i would agree I, th I think i would agree with that i think just hearing it in a client's voice when Calling a lawyer is scary, right? No one's called a lawyer. Mm -hmm. and it, or it's either scary or they're really excited. They don't know what to do, right? They're starting yeah. a business. And j and you can hear in their voice when you start the call, like, the, the anxiousness. And then by the end of the call, you can just sense the calm. Like, that's that's the because I, that's truly what I believe we're meant to do. We're meant to give clients peace of mind, whether it's starting a business, whether it's litigation, whether it's planning their estate and what's going to happen after they pass, like it's giving them peace of mind mm -hmm. that it's handled. Like that is, in my opinion, I completely agree. That's probably the best thing we get to do. And then it's just seeing a client succeed. Like I love yeah. when a client has an idea and we watch it come to fruition and we mm -hmm. see two years down the road, like, wow, like they've grown this company. Like yeah. it's, it's pretty cool. Now the worst thing, what would you say? The worst or maybe the most frustrating, yeah, probably is, most frustrating. Is, is truly the, the client that wants to, what do you say, penny wise, pound foolish. Yeah, penny, yeah. They try to do it on their own, mm -hmm. whether they want to save money or they, they think they're, they're smartest in the room mm -hmm. and they run into an issue. Then they call us mm -hmm. angry, angry at us, mm -hmm. angry at the world. <laughs> yeah. Why can't you fix this problem? Mm -hmm. Well, we're already down a path that we can't undo. Right. Uh, that's probably one of the most frustrating because they, yeah. some clients, not all, certainly not all, a very small percentage think that we're magicians, not mm -hmm. attorneys. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, why can't you make this problem go away? Yeah. 
well, th this lawsuit's not going to go away. We're facing pretty hefty penalties here. That's, we have to deal with this now. Um, so that's probably the most frustrating thing. Yeah, I, I think I, I would agree with that. I, I would add one to it. I think the other frustrating piece is not understanding what we do. Like mm. not understanding why that's we do one. things the way we do. Like I'll give you an example. A client will say, hey, um, you know, got this contract. I just need you to look at this thing, this one yeah. thing. I'm like, well, okay, but <laughs> I don't, I mean, that's like really, that's like coming to, that's like having a leak in your ceiling, right? Like there's a pipe up there. I have water dripping, calling a plumber saying, hey, just fix the hole. Like, okay, but we got to figure out where the leak is. And, and a lot of times they don't, because again, they, they, they have these horror stories of lawyers. They think we cost a lot of money. Yeah. They don't necessarily, they can go online. They think they can use AI to just figure out. And then they get caught up in a situation where they're dealing with a contract. Maybe there's change that are made. They don't understand what it means. They said, hey, can you just review the, these, these two provisions for me? Like, don't take a ton of time. I'm like, well, yeah, but I'm not going to be able to give you advice. Yeah. I can tell you what the words on that piece of paper mm -hmm. say and mean, but I don't know and I can't tell you how that relates to the entire transaction oh, yeah. without understanding the entire context of the contract. And a lot of times clients get frustrated with that. It's like, but you can't, you, like, again, you're not going to ask a plumber to come to your house and patch a ceiling without fixing the leak. That's what you're asking me to do, yeah. to patch up the drywall but not fix the leak. Right. That great, analogy, great analogy. Yeah, yeah, that analogy makes me think of what we talked about before, which yeah. is uh, a lot of time clients think attorneys are all the same, right? And they <laughs> all have the same experience, yeah. the same knowledge base. So they're not some, yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. That's what I thought. <laughs> so someone will call in and say they have you know, a family law issue, or they have a criminal law issue, mm -hmm. or or on the flip side they have a criminal law attorney reviewing their contracts. Right. We see that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And they say, well, this attorney, he, he let me know this is okay. Well, well, wait a minute. Do you go to the podiatrist <laughs> when you have a heart problem? Right. <laughs> no. Yeah. They're both doctors in yes. their own right, yes. but you're going for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. So finding an attorney who actually uh, focuses mm -hmm on that particular industry or that particular problem. That's what you're looking for. Yeah. They're not all one and the same. Sure. Yeah. And that's anyone listening to this needs to understand that if you're an entrepreneur, yeah. work with a business lawyer. Like that's because again, a, a general practitioner can tell you, yeah, you need this. We're going to actually fix the problem and put it together the right way. That's like to the right. doctor knowledge, like going to the family medicine. Yeah, you got a heart problem. Go to the cardiologist to get it fixed and get it diagnosed. Like, I don't do that. Right. Same thing with the law. Like we have, like people need to understand it because again, they get they get caught up in these situations where they go to that lawyer, and then they pay that lawyer to do something, and then they have to spend ten times the amount to unwind that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, ah, like I had a, a this was years ago. A neighbor of mine. They're no longer neighbors, but they had, they had, they knew us lawyers. They uh, they came to me after the fact, but they. They had a friend of theirs that was a lawyer that wasn't a business lawyer set up a company for them to buy real estate, but they set it up as an S corporation, which is the wrong way to do it. And they were wondering why they couldn't do these certain tasks. I'm like, well, you're set up the wrong way. Like, who did this? They're like, well, our friend is a lawyer. And I'm like, okay, well, this, you went to the wrong lawyer. But they, they, it, they couldn't comprehend, mm -hmm. yeah. like, to that point. It's like, well, he, he should have known. I said, well, no, like, he should have told you he shouldn't be doing this, but... <laughs> They did it, and that, you know, again, like, I remember when I started practicing law, like, people in my family be like, oh, like, what about this? I'm like, call a criminal lawyer. I don't know. Like, call call, <laughs> yep. call a, a personal injury Like, I don't, I have no idea what to tell you. Like, I don't know. That's, you know, that's yeah. just an impossible thing to do, yep. to know all the laws. You can't. Well, it goes back to Matt's point, too, where mm -hmm. you, you can't undo right. a lot of things easily and quickly, you know. No. The, 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 that's one of the things, too. Like, early on, we were talking about different things, but the expectations. Mm -hmm. The expectations are, you know, when... Somebody, I'm hosting an event. Mm -hmm. it, it, do it every year. It's a big fishing expo. And it's funny because I'll have a person reach out to me. And if I don't respond right away, then there's a messenger, there's a text message, <laughs> voicemail, <laughs> email. I'm like, what the hell? This is, yeah. you give me like 15 minutes, man. Yeah. But, you know, it's just, that's just how it goes. Yeah. That's a good thing. They trust in you and they, yeah. they know you're going to take care of them and that kind of stuff. But it's like, yeah. man, some days it just gets. Oh, there are Crazy many, there are many days where, like, and I've done it to myself yeah. because I do respond quickly to clients and I, I have clients and, and friends of mine that are clients that, you know, they'll call me and I don't answer. And then like 10 minutes later, they call back 
And I'm like, I'm still on the same call. Like I'll text them. Like, hey, I'm still in the same meeting I yeah. was 10 minutes ago. So it's, and that's what I'm learning as I've gotten older mm -hmm. and wiser is to set better expectations with people up front. Like I always tell clients now, like, hey, you have my cell phone number. You have, you have ways to contact me. If you send me something, and I don't get back to you within 48 hours. Assume something happened. I'm, I'm human. I may have missed the email. I may have forgot to just text me again or call me again. Like, you're not going to be annoying me. But if I don't respond to you in an hour, give me at least the day to get back to you. Like, <laughs> well, the expectations, they're a two-way street. Yeah, too. absolutely they are. Because you yes. expect to be paid. <laughs> you oh, know, things like that. So. <laughs> that is a, there's a whole other story about that, too. <laughs> right, yes, right, absolutely sure. correct. That We've all 100. been through those. Right? Yeah, and, and you've learned as, as, as we've gotten better as a firm, you start learning to identify the the client avatar that may be the challenging ones to collect dollars from and we've just learning to filter that out better isn't it funny how you um if you're meeting with a, a prospective mm -hmm. client it for me it's a it's a two-way interview oh yeah i'm trying to determine and i'm not bragging or anything like that but my business is in a position where you can be a little bit more selective mm -hmm. sometimes it's a two-way street. If there are little flags that start popping up, oh, yeah. those are yeah. all things that we learn to look for. One hundred percent. But you know, it's it's um it's a lot of fun when when you anchor a really great client. And yeah. You, so you, like Matt said earlier, when they really appreciate what yeah. you did. That's it. That's that, it. At the end of the day, that's that's what you're doing this for. Yeah. I mean, a piece. Plus, we got bills to pay, yeah. you know, but the thing is, we want them to be satisfied and, you yeah. know, uh, that becomes referrals and everything else. They become Absolutely. our ambassadors, yeah. basically. Yeah. And, and those are the clients that never question a bill, right? Yeah. They just, they know the value they get. Mm -hmm. the, the one, the, the clients that are difficult are the ones that, you know, that will question a $300 bill. Like, you know, well, I don't, I don't, well, it's like, it's, you know, it was an hour of my time, but I actually gave you three hours I didn't charge you for. And it's yeah. like, that's what we're learning too, is we've, we've gotten to that position as a firm where we want to make sure we have the right relate. Cause it's a, it's a two way street. Like we are dating and then getting married. We're mm -hmm. getting into it. It's not a train. It's a relationship for us. We want to be with you long term. So we need to make sure we both like each other. We trust each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a vetting process. We've gotten better at where it's always a work in process. Well, um, I mean, you said it perfectly, a relationship based. Yeah clients that are prospective clients that call in and that you can tell that this is a transaction for them. Mm -hmm. They want to give, give you an mm -hmm. assignment or a matter. They want it in re response and they want to get out of here and they never yep. want to talk to you again. Yep. Is that really the client for us? Because yeah. it truly is relationship based because we want to know about your business. Mm -hmm. We want to know, you know who's involved, who are the owners, where do you want to go? Where do you want to, what are your goals? Yeah. And if it's just simply coming in the door, please do this and I'm out of here. It's not exactly the perfect client for us. No, right. no, not at all. Absolutely not. Yeah. I'll give you guys a sales pitch because I will say Matt is basically like my therapist. I love it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I ask a lot of questions. That is also what we do. Yeah. yeah. We, we are I didn't know therapists. you had a background in psychology. I'm a psychologist. So yeah, there you go. Or Matt. Because, oh, shit, it's Antonino again. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but here, they, they do bring up interesting points because, like, you know, even, I mean, I won't get into the details, but the other day I was talking to Matt and he was like, he gave me advice as like a friend but also like yeah. as like understanding business and i was like made me rethink yeah. the direction we were going on a certain deal yeah. it's like okay like you don't yeah. you're not going to get that like you said from legal zoom or something like no. that having like a, who understands my agenda exactly and where i'm trying to go and having like the understanding like this probably isn't the right move you know yeah, yeah. it's it's priceless and that was a I remember that conversation. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what we like. That's where mm -hmm. we want to go. That's the optimal position with clients where we can tell them, look, yes, we are your counsel, mm -hmm. but we wear many hats. I got to take off my mm -hmm. legal hat yes. for a second because we, I just want to talk to you as just as a business owner mm -hmm. and business decision maker. Do I think this is the best deal for you? Mm -hmm. Legal stuff aside, let's just talk about this piece. And a lot of people don't like that. They want to be transactional. Look, yeah. if I wanted your opinion about my business, I would ask for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just tell me if I can do this legally mm -hmm. and then get out of here. Okay, well, that's that's not what we want to hear. So yeah. perfect. I mean, that's a perfect example. Yeah. That's exactly where we want to be with clients. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, I mean, we... we we have to be able to talk clients off the ledge sometimes mm -hmm. because, some, because you know, what they're dealing with is the most important thing in their life right now. So we have to make yeah. them feel like it's ours as well, which it is. But sometimes it's just, it's just giving them that 
peace of mind in that it'll be okay. But other times, to Matt's point, like sometimes like, I'm brutally honest with people as well. Mm-hmm. Like I had I had a potential well, client that, you know, a different matter we were going to work with. We're not working with this person. They were a referral from someone, and this person was getting into this business and was very excited about it. But I'm like, and I just was talking to this person saying, there's a lot of risk. Like, I've seen this happen. How are you going to deal with this, 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 and this? And they were taken aback by it because they wanted me to be the chilling. Like, this is the best idea ever. You should definitely do this. I'm like, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying these are risks you have to account for. And then they sent me a follow-up email, like, basically saying, hey, I was taken aback. I said, look, this is not going to work. This is just, I, I appreciate that, but I'm, I'm never going to just sugarcoat something for a client. I'm never going to feed you things that I don't think will work. If that's what you're looking for, I'm just uh, no harm, no foul. Like I appreciate our relationship and I appreciate you being open with me. I'm being open with you. Like this is not going to work because I'm not going to do something for you without telling you the risks I see. Mm -hmm. And if you're not willing to listen to those risks, this will never work. Mm -hmm. And that's just what we have to do sometimes. And sometimes people like to him, like that's a transaction. They wanted someone to just tell them that's awesome. Let's do it. Set it up. Go on your way. I'm like, well, there's some stuff you got to think about that's going to really catch you off guard if you don't plan for these things. And that's how that whole conversation went. It was interesting, definitely. Yeah, I mean, a conversation that ended positively. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember we had a client who really wanted to pursue a franchise. Mm -hmm. Another law firm, once you start talking about entering the world of becoming a franchisor, you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars worth of legal fees. Absolutely. Any other law firm, they're like, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's go. (laughs) We sat down and talked with this person. Is this the right move right now? Yeah. Let's really walk through that. And at the end of that conversation, I think they were shocked that we were yeah. saying to them, let's pump the brakes just for a little bit. Yeah. Let's go this other route. Mm-hmm. It's going to save you a ton of money. And we can see if this is a viable business plan of mm-hmm. expansion. And then if so, then let's cross that bridge. Yeah. And at the end of that meeting, they were extremely appreciative uh, so we're obviously they're still a client and we're yeah. still moving forward. And it's, uh, you know, that's just another example where it ended a little bit more positively yeah, than, than that particular client that we had to kind of separate ways. But uh, yeah, it's really just that relationship based yeah. with our clients. Yeah. And I think that speaks to like your kind of entrepreneurial backgrounds. I think as a leader, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, as a boss manager, whatever it may be, yeah. you have to be willing to take criticism. Yeah you know, as well as you give it, you know, be able to listen to your team, the yeah. people who, you know, cause that's why I always say, it's like, I tell my guys to like, it's not a competition. We're mm-hmm. all trying to move in the same direction. Right. If yes. we are butting heads, cause you're, it's some politic game of like, yep. you know, who likes who more, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. It's not going to work. Like it's, you know, um, I don't know. I just, I think that speaking of the corporate world too, like I was there for like three years and there's a lot of that. It's like, oh, yeah. you know, Who's going to get this promotion? Right. Who's going to do that? And it's like, it, it's not advantageous to anyone. No, it's not. And it doesn't, it doesn't lead to good work product. It doesn't lead to, to productivity. And to your point, like as an entrepreneur, like I would want someone to tell me those things. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm in that, like I want someone to shoot straight with me. Like tell me my idea is stupid. Mm-hmm. Like I've, I've had many potential client calls where I'm like, ah, this is not going to work. Like I've seen it. Like I don't spend the money. Like, don't, like, I don't, I won't take a client's money. Like, I had a call with a guy yesterday. It's an entertainment law client. I said, yeah, we could do this, but it's not going to get you anywhere. You're going to waste a bunch of money. So I, here's what I would do. Just do this yourself. And then if you still want to pursue it, fine. But I, I don't really think there's anything to do here. Like, don't pay us to do these things. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And a lot of law firms won't do that because it's, it's transactional to yeah. us. It's like, I, my, my name's on the line. So to me, it's yeah. like, I look at, like, how would I want to be treated? Sometimes, I just treat people the same way. It's sometimes it's saving people from themselves. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's a great point. So one of the things I, I love about these these little intimate interviews that we're doing for yeah. the podcast, um, I've never been in here before. Yeah. Right? I come in, and I was familiar with the buildings. I've yeah. conducted a lot of meetings in these Foster Plaza area. Walk through the door, certain impressions, smell, feel, mm-hmm. lighting, you know, everything like that. But this is where, and I think I mention this every time, it's that now it's that peek behind the curtain. Yeah. You're, you're another law office, but now people can see yeah. and hear, mm-hmm. listen to your, you know, your stories. They see you, they hear your voice. Mm-hmm. Hopefully that compels them yeah. to, um, you know, 
be comfortable picking up the phone and, and having you help them with some of their business um, yeah. questions and things like that. Yeah, we would love that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Very cool. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, so I know we're coming up almost on like the hour here. Yeah. So um awesome. Right before we kind of wrap things up, there's always one question that we ask and I'm going to I'll pose it to both of you. Okay. I don't know who wants to answer <laughs> first. But that question is if you can give one word of advice to a young entrepreneur or someone who wants to start a business, what would that be? Going off of personal experience because I I explained it how something wasn't something didn't sit right with me when I was an accountant. And then when I was at a larger law firm, so everything, you have to trust your gut. What I didn't know what it meant. A lot of people have these aha moments of this is what I want to do. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm an art, I'm a, you know, I'm an arguer. I, I like to debate mm -hmm. things. What Rocco said, he kind of already knew his path. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that going through my career. I knew something wasn't right. So I continued to try to pivot and find what wasn't working. And although I didn't know the right strategy, I kept trusting my gut to, okay, I need to make a pivot. I need to change something. I need, and then ultimately I got to where I feel very comfortable. I love what we're doing here. I love what we're building here. So everything's phenomenal, but it's really just, if you're going to make the leap and be an entrepreneur, you have to have some level of trust with yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's a new one. And that's really, yeah. it's super important. It is. Um, love that. I really love that thought. I would, I would say, I, I mean, I agree with that completely. I would also say if it's truly, if you're ready to do it, right, there's two things you have to understand. It'll be harder than you ever could have possibly imagined, mm -hmm. but the results will be more beautiful than you could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be okay with both of those things. You've got to get through the first to get to the latter. Yeah. And it's like, I didn't understand that. Like, I didn't understand how hard it was going to be. Like, I always thought, like, I, I was always a smart kid. I was able to figure things out. I was always, like, a good athlete. And, like, things came easy to me. This was the hardest thing I've ever done. But I could have never imagined being where we are this quick and, like, getting to do what we do. It's just I couldn't see the upside because mm -hmm. I couldn't. It was just, and I think, you know, a lot of people I've known that are entrepreneurs quit because it got too hard. And it, when it, it always gets the hardest before it gets easy. And people just stop right before they get there. And I've seen it happen so many times. So just when it's getting really hard is when you have to keep pushing forward, yeah. truly. Yeah. I it. feel the same way. Like there were times early on when I thought, I only got like one more month where I yeah. can continue doing this. Yeah. I mean, it's just not working the way I mm -hmm. thought. Then all of a sudden, one phone call mm -hmm. can change everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that's exactly um, right. And it, but again, you're chalking all these things up as the, the, the learning experiences, the, the cool stuff that we're able to share yeah. with people. Yeah, absolutely. So cool. Yeah, love it. Yeah, well, thank you both. This was a great yeah, conversation. Well, oh, yeah, thank you. Awesome. hopefully this you guys fantastic. enjoyed it. Yeah, so. absolutely, man. This was great. Like, yeah. You guys came to us, which is even better. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> little mobile podcast it. setup. It's, it's always yeah. nice to kind of show people in their, like, natural yeah. habitat. You know? Yeah, this is, yeah, this <laughs> so. is definitely our natural habitat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Absolutely. This is why I appreciate it, man. Thank yeah. you. Thank well, you both. Look forward to catching up again. Yeah, maybe. absolutely. So you've been here 18 months. Maybe in 18 months we do this again and see yeah. where they yeah. are heading into that. We may be in a different spot by then. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. It seems, yeah, yeah you never know, man. Definitely. You're welcome it's to come good. back anytime. Well, we cool. wish you guys the best. Thank and we you. Thank, thank you for taking a few minutes with us. Oh, it's our absolutely. pleasure. Yeah.